My name's Philip Fowler. I'm gonna, it's, again, it's a little bit of a gear change, but I'll, I'll make a few links back to, back to Tim's talk. And if you have a tablet or a phone, you, now might be a good time to get it out, because there's a bit where you can sort of try it as we go, if, if you want, if you've got any signal, that is. Okay. So I'm going to be talking about how we've been trying to enlist the help of of anyone so they can become a citizen science to help us classify um, different TB strains that the cryptic project that Tim talked about uh, is currently collecting. So I need to just backpedal a bit before we get the phones out. And Tim talked about how we're going to characterise those strains and try and work out which drugs are effective on them and which aren't. And the way we're doing that is rather than using those tubes that we had pictures of, because we'd need too many tubes, um, is to use one of these. So this is it's a fairly straightforward scientific bit of kit, really. It's a 96-well plate, um, but this one's been specifically developed for TB. Um, each little well has in the bottom of it a, a little dried-on amount of uh, an antibiotic that, that works on TB. Um, there's only 14 antibiotics on here, and so all the, all the, well, we'll see it in a minute, but they all have different uh, concentrations of drug. So what you do is you, you take the sample from a person, you grow it for a bit, and then you inoculate it onto the plate, and you leave it for two weeks to grow. And then you take a photo, and it looks something like this. This is quite an easy one to read, to look at, because um, the sort of the dark grey blobby bits is the TB growing, um, but there are, there are more difficult ones. So, but it's a, bit, it's a bit difficult to look at a plate in one go. So what's easier to do is to break it down into the 14 drugs. And so here, to pick out some of the ones we've heard about already, so rifampicin is halfway down the column on the right. Um, if we look at linezolid, which is the second one down on the right, you can sort of see what's happening. So the first well has a certain amount of the drug, and then it doubles each time we go a long one. So it goes two, four, six... Uh, 248. <laughs> Where am I again? <laughs> 1632, 64. So by the time we get to the far right hand well, we've got 64 times the amount of antibiotic we have in the first one. So what you can see there is the TB is actually quite happy growing in the first one. It looks quite happy in the second one as well. By the time we get to the third and the fourth one, it's beginning to perhaps grow a bit more slowly. And then by the time we get to the fifth one, so 16 times the concentration, the antibiotic's now working. And so that's what we're trying to measure here, is we're trying to find out what concentration of that antibiotic stops that particular strain of TB growing. And Cryptic is going to be collecting tens of thousands of these samples uh, across the world in the next few years. So there's a real question about how do we measure these plates. And because originally the plan was for an expert, um, such as Kevin here, <laughs> to look at one of these plates and, and make that measurement. And the problem is that it is ultimately a subjective measurement because you have to look and you have to decide, is there growth there, is there not growth there? There's something there, it might be growth, do I care? Is it maybe a bit of sediment? I'm not sure. It's a subjective question. And one of the worries we had was we have all these labs around the world and what if, what if they had a, having a bad day? What if they're a bit tired? What if, what if different people are being trained in different ways? How can we f check those uh, potential biases? Because it's really important for this project that the data is as consistent and as accurate as possible. So as you do, we were having a meeting on a Thursday about a year and a half ago um, in the seminar room in the main building and thinking about this, and I'd actually registered Bash the Bug for another citizen science project, but it suddenly occurred to me, well, this is actually perfect for a Zooniverse project. Now, Zooniverse is a platform for citizen science that's run out of Oxford and Chicago, <coughs> and what it is is anyone can go to their website, zooniverse.org, and you can help scientists classify images, typically, for a particular problem. So you might have heard for example, Penguin Watch. So here you're shown a photo from a, a camera that's set up in the Antarctic, and we're asked, are there any penguins in this photo? Now, this is an easy one, because the answer is yes. <laughs> but what you're then asked to do in the next, um, next screen is put a little dot on where all the penguins are, and also if there are any baby penguins and any penguin eggs and any other animals. So that's... that's, that's 
more what Zooniverse is known for. They've also got a lot of uh, astrophysics projects. What they haven't had, which I think is a real shame, is many projects in the sort of biomedical area. But hopefully you can see, and this is where you can get your phones out now if you want. So if you go to bashthebug.net and then click the red button, it will take you to the Zooniverse page for this project. Um, and it will show you a little tutorial, which I haven't got here, but you can go through that or you can just skip it if you want to follow along. Um, and so if you click Get Started, and I've skipped through the tutorial, you're shown part of one of those photos from one of the images that's been collected somewhere in one of the labs <coughs> belonging to the project around the world. Now, crucially, what you're also shown at the top is the two wells that don't have any antibiotic in. So these are what we call the positive control wells. And when, when I watched um, an expert looking at the plate, and actually it was Anna who's sitting at the back, <laughs> What I realised was she was looking at the positive control wells and constantly comparing between the growth in the positive control wells and what was happening in the wells with the antibiotic. Because what you're thinking is, is not how well is the drug go working, but how, what's it doing compared to when the TB is just sitting there on its own. So that's why they're there. Now I've picked a fairly easy example. We've got reasonable but not amazing growth in the control wells. Um, and we've got five wells, sorry, six wells here. I'm not good with numbers today. Um, and there's obviously something going on in rel well one. So I'm going to say, I think that's TB. I think it's, that's actually growing. There's nothing in well two. If you look really carefully, there's a dot in well three. But I'm a fairly optimistic person, so I'm going to say, ah, oh, that's just sediment or something. And it's a lot less than what's in the control. So I'm going to say the lowest concentration that is stopping the growth of the bug is well two. So I choose this option, and then I choose two. And then I go on and do another, another, um, another image. Now, an important thing is, and this is where the power of the sort of citizen scientists can overcome or potentially be even more consistent than the experts, is we show each image 15 times. So 15 different people give an answer, and we take a consensus. And the beauty of that is, is the consensus they come to should be wonderfully consistent in the way that if I ask 15 different experts, I might get 15 different answers. Because remember, each, each plate's only being read by one expert. We can't, can't give the same plate to 15 experts. And so they might not give the same answer as the experts, but they should give this really lovely, consistent answer. So we launched um, April last year. We've had nearly 11,000 people now try the project out. Um, obviously a lot in the first month or two and then a sort of steady stream after that. When you look at how much work people do, some people actually do a lot of classifications. So the top 20% do over 80% of the classifications. Actually just the top 10 volunteers do nearly 20% of all the classifications to date. And our top volunteers, a lady who lives in Belgium, um, has done over 20,000 on her own, so <laughs> how she finds the time, I don't know. Most people take about six seconds of classification, some people take quite a bit longer, um, but overall we're coming up on the 800,000 mark, so, which is far in excess of where I thought we'd be you know, this time last year, so that's amazing, and you can see that it's not showing much sign of tailing off. We've worked our way through three data sets now, um, and we've got a lot more to go, thanks to Cryptic. Overall, and this is still fairly preliminary, this is looking at the first data set. Overall, the volunteers, the consensus, rather, of the volunteers agrees very well with the experts. So a bit less than 90% of the time, they're within a well of the experts. Interestingly, where they tend to disagree it's that the volunteers are giving a higher number for the well than the experts. So in other words, they're, they're being a little bit more pessimistic. And you can see that when you pull out some of the examples. So this is for amicacin, rifabutin, and levofloxacin. It's kind of hard to see on the screen, but these are all, these are all difficult images to read. Uh, it's probably easiest to see in the amicacin one. There is something going on in well one, but there's these tiny dots in wells two, three, four, five, and possibly six. Um, and the volunteers are, I think, naturally 
being a little bit more cautious and pessimistic, partly because we've told them, you know, this is TB. It's an unpleasant disease, as you've heard. And so when you're looking at the plate, collectively people are being a little bit more cautious than perhaps the experts are. But again, the, the value of this should be their consistency. And when you, when you actually demonstrate it to people at public science events and things, you, you begin to realise it's actually a bit of a personality test. So some people go, a bit like me, go, well, you know, that's three. <laughs> there's, there's nothing in, in four and five, that's fine. Whereas some people, you know, they, they, they take a lot of time over it and they think hard about it and they don't want to get, the, the, don't, don't get it wrong when, again, it's really a subjective task. Um, but yeah, we don't want... Yeah, we don't want the people on the bottom too, so that's fine. But also, the volunteers have actually given us stuff back that we, we hadn't even thought would happen. So there's talk boards on the website as well. And so this is an example from January when Krista FB left me a message and said, I keep seeing this funny fuzzy shape in well seven, but it, it moves around. And I don't know what it is. And so we got in touch... I didn't know, we got in touch um, with the lab and they sent us a photo back and said, yeah, yeah, we've seen this. This is, this is for clofazamine. And what happens is well seven, of course, is the well with the, the highest concentration of the drug and it crystallises out and you can see it on the bottom of the plate. It doesn't happen all the time, but it does happen sometimes. And of course, it's a black and white image, so it's not orange because the drug is orange, um, but that's what the volunteer was seeing. And we wouldn't have realised this otherwise. And there have been other examples of this. Um, if you want to find out more, just go to the website and there's some blog posts and stuff below. Thanks, Thanks for listening.